When compared to their white counterparts, by most measures and with few exceptions, a significant portion of black children in American schools are performing at dismal rates. Black students make up the fastest growing group of children filling jail cells. They're suspended at and expelled three times as often as white children, and they're subjected to harsher scrutiny and suffer from lower expectations from both teachers and authority figures. According to Dr. Tyrone Howard, author of Why Race and Culture Matter in Schools, when examining the academic achievement gap that exists in the U.S. school system, the topic that frequently lies beneath the surface, uh, yet is rarely addressed in any explicit, thoughtful and critical manner, is the role of race. To best understand race and its complexities in education, it is imperative to examine and understand race and its legacy in the United States. Here to talk about dealing with issues of race and implicit bias in education are Kalila Brand, former New York City teacher and associate research scientist and equity coach at the NYU Metropolitan Research Center on Equity and Transformation of Schools. Welcome to BK Live, Kalila. Thank you. And joining us via Skype is David Easton, former New York City teacher at the Brooklyn Free School and the, the current director of development at Youth Effects. Thank you both for being with us. Well, good to be here. Yeah, so let's just go ahead and dive right in. You two both, as educators, may remember that earlier this year, in response to a lot of the ongoing racial trauma that was taking place throughout the country, um, New York City Schools Chancellor Carmen Farina issued quite a, a remarkable charge to the, her, her, her dependee, those who depend upon her, the employees and the parents who uh, mentor their children. And she said that, I strongly believe that as New York City educators and parents, we have a moral obligation to address the difficult questions about race, violence and guns and to engage students in the critical work of healing our country. We must not avoid these tough conversations. They are necessary if we hope to build a just society for all. And we know that talking about race is, is a difficult task for anyone, um, especially teachers um, who oftentimes aren't trained. Um, Gary Howard, who's an educational consultant and author, he has a, a really powerful quote. He says, it's no mere coincidence that children of certain racial, cultural and li linguistic and economic groups, those that have been marginalized by the force of Western uh, white uh, domination, are the same children that are failing today in our schools. Um, so, can we talk a little bit about that? Um, just, Kalila, can you share a little bit about the historical role um, that race has played in American classrooms and kind of how this contributes to some of the challenges we have about talking to race, talking about race in the classroom? So, I'd like to start with a quote by Brother James Baldwin, who said, education is indoctrination if you're white and subjugation if you're black. Mm. When we go back to the history of public education in America, first of all, Jefferson said, we're going to have two tracks the laboring and the learned. He wasn't even talking about people of color. That was just white people. Mm. So add into it the descendants of enslaved people. Add into it linguistically diverse people, um, Asian Americans, Mexican Americans. And there's no place for us. There's no place for us to really see ourselves and become our true, better selves. Mm. It's interesting, because I think when we think about Thomas Jefferson and we think about sort of the legacy of race in, in American society, and even if we were to come forward into, you know, Abraham Lincoln, there was some clear um, continuity, continuity between what they thought about the intellectual capacity of black children. And they were very clear in saying, you know, Thomas Jefferson says, never yet has a black uttered a thought above the level of plain narration. You know, Thomas Jeff uh, Abraham Lincoln, the great emancipator, talks about how, you know, he is in favor that if there has to be a superior and an inferior position, that the superior would be assigned to the white race. And so when we're talking about how these ideas show up in education, the educational needs of the descendant of those who were slave owners can be very different than the educational needs of the descendants of those who were the enslaved. Can you speak a bit to how that shows up in the classroom today? It shows up in our beliefs, our policies, and our practices. What we define as appropriate behavior, what we define as being um, obstinate or pushing back, how we interact with each other. You walk into any school and you might see a group of children sitting down and one little black boy around over in the corner sharpening his pencil. His teacher says, uh, James, would you like to come to the carpet? He says no. She kicks him out, call the dean, he's not listening. She asks James a question. Those little, small things, whereas in our family, James, come to the carpet, or if you're going to ask a question, you're going to allow his answer to, to stay and then say, all right, when you're done, come on to the carpet. It's these small things that we don't even think about before we even get to the big things. Right. So that idea about our, our, the feelings that we may have about race, whether we're aware of them or not, they do show up in how we interact in the classroom. Now, David, I'd really like to turn to you now and, and 
see if you could jump in here a little bit, because as a, an educator in the New York City public schools, which, again, are among the most segregated in the nation, um, what are some of the challenges that educators who do not share racial um, affinity with their students, what are some of the challenges that they face? Yeah, I mean, I think that to baseline remember that teaching is a human interaction and that you are need to connect on a human level with your students and your students need to connect with you as a teacher on a human level and that the difference between you know being a white teacher and having black or hispanic students right is that white teacher you're bringing with you that invisible backpack that famous backpack right that has all sorts of things packed inside of it that get in the way of really you know interacting and relating with your students and i think that um without examining you know that those biases, um, kind of your own cultural perspective, um, you're really like putting an obstacle, a separation between you and your students, which can be, you know, detrimental at the, the slightest and can be devastating at the worst. Okay. Um, Geneva Gay, who's one of the pioneers that really speaks to culturally responsive teaching, who's actually going to be here on December 8th at Medgevers College, she has a, a really powerful quote, and she talks about culturally responsive teaching, and she says, it, is, it can be defined as using cultural knowledge, prior experiences, and frames of references, and performance styles of ethnically diverse, diverse students to make learning encounters more relevant to and effective for them. It teaches to and through the strengths of these students. One of the things that always comes up in the workshops that we do is oftentimes when educators um, go to the inner city, um, they think about all the deficits that those, uh, that those young people have without understanding the assets that they bring to the table. How does this impact uh, some of those issues, Dave, if you could speak to that a little bit? Why is it yeah, important to know the assets? I think that's a huge, a huge piece. If you, you know, walk into any kind of teacher's lounge or room, right, where it's a primarily white teaching staff, you're just going to hear these terrible things about the way that, you know, the teachers are perceiving and talking about the, the neighborhood and the, that the school's in and the neighborhood that their students live in. And I think that by having that focus already, then when you're stepping into the classroom, you're then seeing, you know, everything from a lens of detriment. And instead, really like looking at what the strengths are, what the positives are, getting to know your neighborhood that the school is in and that their students live in really changes your perspective about your students and about kind of the world that they're coming from in bringing it to school. And if you're not part of that world, I really think that it's your, as a teacher, your responsibility to get to know that world, to interact, to be, you know, part of it as much as you can, because um, otherwise you're, you're just, it's two separate things and you're going to bring, you know, all the kind of colonial, uh, imperialistic kind of like white views into the classroom and then, you know, and then sit there and scratch your head as a teacher, why your students are disengaged, again, at the least, and then maybe outright defiant at the worst. And it's like uh, to, to kind of imagine that all that stuff's happening for no reason uh, seems completely irresponsible. And I think that, like, uh, you know, a teacher's job is to be involved in that. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that colonial history. One of my favorite quotes is that we are all historical products. Who we are today is largely the result of choices that elders and, and ancestors made in our past, right? Um, and I think it's important to recognize that in this moment, we all carry the legacy of race in our bodies in some way. And I, I kind of want to shift a bit, because a lot of times when we think about culturally responsive teaching, we think about white teachers, black students. But we also have a dynamic where, after integration, most of the schools that were educating black children, that employed black educators, were shut down, most black educators were shut out of the education uh, professional, professional space. And now we have educators, black and white, who are being educated in the same classrooms, who are going to be prepared in much the same ways, and, regardless of their race, may carry some of the same negative biases that that training uh, prepares our, our white educators for, may also show up in our black educators as well. How do we deal with that? And, and what does that mean when you, as an educator, who may be similarly aligned or racially aligned with your student population? and yet you still carry some of that anti-black uh, negative bias in training. So we like to say that every teacher in every school is culturally responsive. Mm. But to whose culture are we responsive mm. to? Wow. Right? To whose culture, and then to whose culture are we unresponsive to? Mm. Um, the hardest part of my work is to deal with the educators who look like me, mm. but who think like 
a colonial right, <laughs> white right, educator. Right. Because it's this cognitive dissonance that they're going through. How they've been trained, what we've been taught, how we are successful in a system that has been created for us to fail. Hmm. So if I've been successful in that system, then of course you, young child, can also be successful. You just have to do this. And what I love about this generation uh, of, of students, they're like, no, not so much. Right. I'm not going to do that. I want to bring my full self. I want to bring my ancestors. I want to bring my heritage. I want to bring my culture right. into the classroom. And I want to be able to see and learn from multiple lenses, right. not just the imperialistic lens right. of colonial dictators. Right, right. And it can be challenging, right, because I think one of the things that we've seen in the classroom, like with your student, Lingo, who, according to his IEP, this student had traditionally been seen as someone who had speech problems, who was in need of a therapeutic uh, framework to deal with speech issues. And yet, if you wanted to finish the story yes, in the street, um, he was— One day I see, his, uh, I see his notebook, and, he, and it says Lingo. Now, on his IEP, he has a speech impediment. But in the neighborhood, he's lingo. He's a wordsmith with metaphors. Mm -hmm. So it was just interesting to see how confident he was outside, how valued his gifts were outside. But in the classroom, he was deemed special ed. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, that, that really speaks to um, understanding the assets. And I guess my question, another question I'd have for you, Kalila, is what steps can educators take to be more culturally responsive? They have to decolonize their mind, right? It, it, being culturally responsive is not a thing that you put on. You can't go, okay, today I'm going to drive through and get this. Can I get another three of culturally responsive it, mm. with the side of, like, Mexican heritage? Mm. No, it has to be a way of life. You have to be critically conscious. You have to ask yourself, I've always been taught this. Is there a possibility to do something else? So you have to read. You have to join organizations. You have to be a part of the solutions. You have to push yourself. You have to say, okay, there has to be something wrong. You said this to me when we first met. Do you believe that black children are just born inferior? They come out of the womb inferior? And I said, no. So then what happened? And a, a critically conscious, a culturally responsive, relevant educator constantly asks that questions and seek that answer. And they find a community that will help them to grow, so that what they do in their classroom is provide an environment for students to become their best selves. Mm. And we have more than just slavery. Black right. people doesn't, don't start That's from right. slavery. That's right. right. So how do we start from the beginning, from the genesis, from the out of Africa theory, and have our students reflected in what they're sitting in their classrooms learning? Mm. Right. Mm. You you know, a lot of the research um, looks at um, segregation, and we talk a lot about segregation and the negative aspects of it, but segregation, segregation produced some of the greatest leaders in the African-American community. And a lot of the research will say, um, in those segregated schools, those kids were getting a culturally responsive education that was preparing them to be leaders and to address um, issues of systemic racism. Um, and I would just ask Dave, um, as a last question, what are some of the things you're doing in your work now as a white male that's dealing with, uh, working with pre predominantly uh, children of color to make sure that you make those connections and that you're culturally responsive? Yeah, I think that the, to echo the idea of decolonizing your mind, I think it's amazing. I think that being able to be humble enough to accept that, like, I'm going to have think thoughts and I'm going to do things that are wrong. And so what we do in Youth FX is we get together and we really follow the students. It's a student-centered program where the students come to, to you know, workshop and, and they come with their stories of what's happening in their lives, in their neighborhoods, and we basically are enabling and helping them have the tools to tell their story in the best way that they can. Um, and it, in all different ways, I have to check myself and say, wait a minute, this is not, this is, I'm, I, I'm giving the tools and I'm working on how to make the stories better, but these are not my stories. And I think that that's a, you know, a huge role, uh, especially for white educators, I mean, for white educators to be able to, to have that kind of presence of mind and to be able to think, you know, kind of critically about what you're doing, what you're thinking really at all times. And I really just love that idea of like decolonizing your mind. I think that that's a huge part of it. And really thinking about new ways of marketing education to a population for whom our existing education system may not have been designed, right? We want to thank you guys both so much. I know thank Kalila, you, educators, you. would be able to follow up with the NYU Metro Research Center for additional resources. Um, they can also visit culturallyresponsiveteaching.com and uh, our website, which looks at information on providing professional development for educators. Again, we don't come out of the womb necessarily culturally responsive, but we are uh, empowering our community with the resources to be able to gain that framework and that understanding so that we can be more effective in the classroom. Thank you both. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.